In the early 1990s, a woman in her early 20s named Krista Freider was working as a manager inside of a retail store called the Boston Store in Madison, Wisconsin. Not long after she was hired there, the Boston Store would hire another employee to work at their Madison location. His name was Bart Halderson, and like Krista, he was in his early 20s, although he was three years younger than Krista, and he was hired to be a clerk. Bart and Krista didn't know each other before working at the same location, but their shifts often overlapped, and so in time they got to know each other, and they found they had a lot in common. They both had grown up roughly outside of Madison, Wisconsin. They both had graduated from the same college, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they both shared a love of home design. Krista, who had majored in art history in college, was very passionate about interior home design. As for Bart, he was just one of those people who naturally could fix just about anything with his bare hands, and growing up, his favorite projects were anything to do with home repairs. Whether it was something super simple or super complex, he didn't care, he just found it incredibly satisfying to keep a home in immaculate condition. And so Bart and Krista bonded over their commonalities, and in time, their working friendship evolved into a full-fledged romance. And by 1994, they had left the Boston store, they had gotten married, and they had moved in together to their own apartment in DeForest, Wisconsin, which is not far from Madison. Two years after that, in 1996, Bart and Krista welcomed their first child into the world. It was a little boy who they named Mitchell. And as soon as Mitchell was born, Krista decided she wanted to stay home with the baby, and Bart was in full support, and so he went out and he got a great job as an accountant, which paid enough money to pay for the whole family. And 18 months after Mitchell was born, Bart and Krista welcomed their second and final child, another boy who they named Chandler. A few years after Chandler was born, Bart and Krista had saved up just enough money that they could finally afford to buy a house of their own. And the house they finally settled on was just this very modest, small, two-story home in this very quiet little town in Wisconsin called Windsor. Windsor is not far from DeForest, where they had been renting an apartment. But this little house in Windsor was perfect for Bart, Krista, and their boys. Not only did it have enough space for the family, but because it was their own house, as soon as they moved in, Krista got to really lean in to her passion for interior design, and she got to design the entire layout of the house. And then she continued to take pride in keeping the house perfectly tidy and beautiful at all times. As for Bart, he immediately began doing home repair project after home repair project. This house became his trophy, and he wanted to make sure his trophy was polished at all times. And it wasn't just the physical house that made this feel like their forever home. It was also their neighbors. As soon as they moved in, Bart and Krista made friends with all of the people that lived on their street, and they were all so friendly and welcoming. And then before long, the Haldersons were deeply invested in community activities like the Boy Scouts and the Kiwanis Club, and they were donating their time and money to other charities. I mean, so quickly, the Halderson family just found where they belonged. And over the next two plus decades, life for the Haldersons in this little home in Windsor remained perfect. Bart continued to move up the ladder at his accounting firm, and Krista continued to be a devoted mother and housekeeper. As for the kids, Mitchell and Chandler, they were given every opportunity their parents could possibly give them. And in that loving and supportive environment, they both thrived. By 2021, the older brother, Mitchell, who was 25 at the time, he had moved out and was living alone in an apartment, and he had graduated from college. He had landed an incredible IT job with a local, very successful company. He was engaged to be married, and he was about to buy his own house. As for the younger brother, Chandler, who was 23 at the time, he was still living at home with Bart and Krista, but he was doing just as well as his older brother. He was in his final year of college, but he had already accepted a full-time job with SpaceX that was set to start in Florida as soon as he graduated. And while he was in his final year of college, in between his studies, he worked part-time at a local insurance company to help pay rent to his parents, and he also volunteered the rest of his spare time with the Madison Police Department on their rescue scuba diving team. 
Chandler was also in a committed relationship with his girlfriend. But despite how well everything was going for Bart, for Krista, for Mitchell, for Chandler, their lives were about to take a serious turn for the worst. It all started in June of 2021. That month, Chandler, who was only weeks away from flying out to Titusville, Florida to start his job with SpaceX, fell down an entire flight of stairs, smashing his head in the process. Now, he immediately picked himself up and tried to tell himself that he was okay, but over the course of that day, he started to feel woozy and disoriented, and his legs started to feel numb. And so in a panic, he rushed himself to the hospital, and unfortunately, when they scanned his brain and they checked him out, out, the doctors discovered he had a severe concussion from this fall and he had a brain bleed that almost certainly would require surgery at some point down the road. Also, the numbness in his legs appeared to be the result of permanent nerve damage. And so suddenly Chandler, who was so excited about this opportunity in Florida, is now back home in a neck brace with a cane to get around. And even with the cane, he can barely walk. And then adding insult to injury, he almost immediately lost the job at SpaceX because he couldn't travel to Florida to start the job. And so they filled it with someone else. Chandler did his best to stay positive positive and optimistic, but I mean, this was a crushing blow. Everything he had worked for had just been taken away. And it was crushing for his family too. I mean, seeing their beloved Chaz, as they called him, laying on the couch looking totally miserable and depressed all day was awful. But despite how bad Chandler's accident was, the trauma it inflicted on Chandler and his family was nothing compared to what happened next. The Haldersons owned a small cabin that was located in a part of Wisconsin called White Lake. It was located about three hours drive to the north of their home in Windsor, and the cabin cabin was situated inside of this rural forested area right near a big lake called White Lake, hence the name of the area. This cabin had been in the Halderson family since the 1940s, and when Mitchell and Chandler were little kids, Bart and Krista would take them up there all the time to go fishing, to go swimming, or just to relax. It was like their vacation home. But at some point, Chandler and Mitchell reached a certain age where they weren't that interested in going to the cabin anymore, and so as a result, Bart and Krista basically stopped going. However, just two weeks after Chandler's horrific injury, there was this huge storm that rolled through the White Lake area. And after the storm had passed, some people who lived permanently in White Lake called Bart and Krista and told them, hey, I was driving past your cabin and I saw there was some broken windows. It looks like your cabin might have been damaged from the storm. And so Bart and Krista, they're thinking, oh my goodness, we got to get up there as soon as we can and patch up that window and fix the rest of the cabin before another storm rolls through and totally ruins the cabin. And so Bart and Krista pull out their calendar and they see the next weekend coming up is the 4th of July weekend. The 4th of July is a very big holiday in America. It's when we celebrate our independence. And the way White Lake celebrates the 4th of July is with a big parade down Main Street and these amazing fireworks out over White Lake. And so Bart and Krista, they figure, you know what, let's just hold off and head up to our cabin in a couple of days to time it with the 4th of July weekend and we can make the necessary repairs and we can enjoy the festivities of the holiday and kind of have a mini vacation up there. And so that was all fine and good. But right before they left for this trip up to White Lake, Bart and Krista started acting a little weird. On the evening of Thursday, July 1st, the day before Bart and Krista are supposed to leave for this trip, they begin packing up their things. And since Chandler lives with them, he's at home, he sees them doing this, and at some point he kind of got up and hobbled over and tried to help them pack, but that was short-lived because his legs were so weak. And so he sat down and just kind of watched them pack. And what he saw is they were packing lots and lots of cash and silver bars into their luggage. Although this was kind of odd to Chandler, he decided not to say anything because he figured, you know what, maybe they want to stash their cash and silver in the cabin like a keepsake. I don't know, but it's their business. It's not mine. And so Bart and Krista, they continue to pack up their things. And Chandler, because he can't go anywhere, just continues to kind of watch them pack. And at some point, Chandler asks his parents, so how are you getting up to White Lake? And his parents would say, oh, we're just getting a ride from our friends, another couple. They're driving us up. 
but they didn't tell him who the couple was. They basically just said, it's our friends. And so again, Chandler's sitting there thinking, okay, this whole thing is a little bit weird, but you know what? It's their business. I'm not going to ask about it. They obviously don't want to tell me. And so he just kind of let it go. And so at some point, Bart and Krista, they finish packing and they move all their luggage to the front of the house, right near the front door. And then a little while later, they and Chandler would retreat to their rooms and they would go to sleep. The next morning, July 2nd, Friday, Chandler got up early at about 6 a.m. And when he got up, he began slowly hobbling his way down the stairs, expecting to see his mom and dad having breakfast and, you know, getting ready to leave because they certainly wouldn't have left without telling him. But he gets downstairs and the house is dark and totally empty and all of the bags that his parents had packed the night before and put near the front door, they were all gone. And so Chandler's thinking, did my parents get up at like 5 a.m. and leave without telling me? And so he goes to the door and he looks out the window thinking, you know, maybe they're out there waiting outside. But when he looked outside, his parents weren't out there. And sure enough, their cars were still in the driveway. And so Chandler was left to believe that, well, I guess my parents did get picked up by whoever these friends were. And they did not feel the need to come tell me they were leaving. Now, this did leave Chandler a little bit shaken up. He just kept thinking about the strangeness of what they were packing and the fact that he didn't know who they were going with. And now this sudden departure... But again, Chandler just told himself that his parents would be just fine. You know, these are just kind of random anomalies, but they are not indicative of there being any issue here. And so Chandler found a way to just kind of push these concerns out of his mind, and he just went about his day. And so because his parents were now going to be gone for the weekend, he promptly called his girlfriend, Catherine, and asked her to come over and stay at his house with him for a couple of days. And so she would, she comes over, and because Chandler can't really do anything because of his injury, they basically spent the weekend just kind of lounging around and eating nice food and watching Netflix. But by the end of the weekend, on Sunday morning, there was an undertone that both of them noticed that something was wrong. Chandler had told his girlfriend about the strangeness of his parents' quick departure to White Lake, but he had said to her, you know, I'm sure it's fine, and she basically said the same thing, that of course your parents are fine. But by Sunday, Bart and Krista had still not called or texted or checked in with Chandler or Mitchell or anybody. They were just totally gone and silent. And whenever Chandler or Catherine tried calling Bart or Krista's cell phone, it didn't even ring. It just went straight to voicemail. But by late that day, Sunday, July 4th, when really concerns were starting to mount about what happened to Bart and Krista, Krista would text her son, Chandler. And what she basically said was, hey, we arrived in White Lake. You know, it's packed here. The service is terrible, but we're going to stick around for the parade and we'll be back either Monday night or Tuesday early. And so as soon as Chandler and Catherine saw this text message, it was like all their worries were completely gone and they were just excited to see Bart and Krista when they came back the next day or the day after. But the next day, Monday, Bart and Krista did not come home. They didn't call anyone. They didn't text anyone. And again, whenever anybody tried calling their cell phones, which now was Chandler, Catherine, and also Mitchell, who had been looped in on what's going on with his parents, whenever they tried calling them, Bart and Krista's phone didn't ring. It just went straight to voicemail. And then the day after that, on Tuesday, July 6th, so this was the day that Krista said they would be home by, they didn't come home. And again, no one could get in touch with them. And again, they did not contact anyone. Additionally, on Tuesday, Krista's office began calling Chandler and Mitchell, asking if they knew where Krista was. Krista had recently taken up a customer service job at an auto body shop, and apparently she was scheduled to work on that day, Tuesday the 6th, and she was scheduled to work on that previous Friday, which was the day Bart and Krista left for the lake, meaning she had left on this trip without telling anybody at work. And according to her boss, Krista was the type of person who, even if she was running a couple of minutes late, she would call ahead or text ahead and let people know. So for her to just completely not show up and tell no one was totally out of character. 
But before Chandler, Mitchell, and Catherine could process this information, Bart's employer began calling them, asking the same things. Hey, do you know where Bart is? He's supposed to be working right now, and we can't get in touch with him, and he didn't put in for time off. And so all afternoon on Tuesday the 6th, Chandler, Mitchell, and Catherine, and other family members are trying to call Bart and Krista. They're calling other people in White Lake to see if anybody knows where they are, but nobody does. And so finally, the next morning on Wednesday, July 7th, when still there was no word from Bart and Krista, Chandler goes to the police and he files a missing person report. And pretty much right away, the police in Windsor contacted the police up north in White Lake and asked them to do a check on this cabin to see if maybe Bart and Krista were there and maybe they just had terrible service or, you know, maybe there was some sort of accident or something that happened. But when the White Lake police arrived at the Halderson cabin, Bart and Krista were not there. No one was there. In fact, the cabin looked like it had not been used in months. The outside was totally overgrown and inside there was no food in the fridge. And interestingly, the police would also tell Chandler, Mitchell, and Catherine that there was no damage done to this cabin. There were no broken windows or any sign, at least no obvious sign, of storm damage to this cabin. And so after this revelation, of course, Bart and Krista's family is like, wait a minute, who called them and told them to head up there to fix these obvious broken windows? Are those the same mystery friends that drove them up in the first place? I mean, what's going on here? Was this some sort of trap? Have they been set up? Are they okay? And so by the following day, Thursday, July 8th, when still there was no sign of Bart or Krista and the police really didn't have any new leads to speak of, Chandler was desperate. And so he went to local media and he said, please run a story about my parents and get the word out there that they're missing and maybe someone knows something and they'll come forward. And so local media, they would do that. They would run this piece. And so while this media coverage is going on on the 8th, Chandler would go back to his home and he would hobble door to door asking each of his neighbors if they had a security camera on the front of their house that might have picked up an angle of the street and so may have seen his parents on the morning of July 2nd when they climbed into that mystery couple's car that took them up to White Lake. Chandler was hoping that if he got this footage, somebody would be able to identify who these mystery friends were. But unfortunately, none of his neighbors had that footage. But as it would turn out, it didn't matter because on that day, the 8th, the police made a discovery that at first seemed relatively minor, relatively small, but when they examined it more closely, they realized it was a huge discovery and it completely broke the case wide open. To understand this breakthrough, we have to go back to June 29th, 2021. So three days before Bart and Krista hopped into that mystery person's car and headed up to White Lake. On that day, June 29th, Bart had finally just had it. There had been something bothering him for a really long time, and he had just finally decided, you know what, today I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. And so Bart pulled out his phone, he punched in a number, he put it to his ear, and after a few rings, a young man named Omar Job answered his call. In total, Bart and Omar would talk on the phone for a total of 17 minutes. And for the first half of the call, it was basically just Bart being really angry and aggressive towards Omar. But then during the second half of the call, when Omar really had a chance to speak for the first time, Bart's tone completely changed. He was no longer angry. He actually sounded totally defeated. And so after this 17 minute phone call finally comes to an end, Bart is left kind of in shock but he knows he now needs to set up an even more intense meeting with a group of people and he needs to tell them what he just learned from Omar. And within 24 hours, Bart had set this additional high stakes meeting with this other group. It was set for 3 p.m. on July 1st. July 1st was the day before Bart and Krista would leave for White Lake. And so on July 1st, the day of this new pivotal meeting, Bart was working from home and at some point he looked at his watch and he saw it was just after 2 p.m. And even though this meeting he was going to have was still an hour away, the location of the meeting was a 
bit of a drive away, and so he knew he needed to leave soon. And so Bart stopped working, and he texted Chandler, who was in the house with him. He just said, ready to leave when you are. Chandler was aware of how important this meeting was for his dad. He also understood the terrible position his dad was in. And so he had agreed to go with his dad to this meeting. And so after a couple of minutes, both Chandler and Bart have gotten dressed and ready for this meeting. And they met downstairs on the first floor. And after kind of a nod to each other, they begin walking towards the front door. But then something happens. Chandler was standing behind Bart. And so as they're moving towards the door, Chandler reaches out and grabs a rifle he was hiding on the first floor. He raises it and he fires at least two shots into his father's back. And then once his father fell to the ground and was either dead or dying, Chandler, calm as can be, pulled out his phone and he texted his mother and told her, hey, dad's phone is dead, so just text me. And then Chandler also sent his mother a text saying, get soda on your way home. To which his mother just wrote, K, I can, smiley face. All Chandler was trying to do was buy as much time as possible to prep the house for his mother's return. And so over the next couple of hours, we don't know exactly what Chandler did, but it's assumed he moved his father's body into some hiding place. And then after maybe trying to clean up a little bit, Chandler laid in wait for his mother. And at 4.58 p.m., Krista would clock out of her job at the automotive shop. She would make a pit stop at a store to buy Chandler some soda. And then between 5.15 and 5.30, security cameras on neighbors' houses would pick her up pulling into her driveway. And and then just a couple of minutes later, she walked inside of her beautiful little dream home where she had raised her family over the past couple of decades, only to be immediately gunned down by her son the second she walked inside. It would turn out Chandler was living a double life. He had never graduated from college. He had gone to college, but for like a semester and flunked out. But he just kept telling his friends and family that he was progressing through college and then he graduated from college, all made up. He also did not have a job at the insurance company. He just told his family that he worked from home, which really meant he sat in his room and played video games all day. He was not a rescue scuba diver for the Madison Police Department because one, he was not a scuba diver, and two, because the Madison Police Department did not have a rescue scuba diving team. And needless to say, he did not have a job with SpaceX. He had never even applied. As for his head injury, he may have bumped his head at some point, and he did go to the doctors by himself sometime in mid-June, but that doctor just told him he might have a mild concussion and then offered him a neck brace and told him, you don't need to wear it. That's only if you want to wear it. But then very quickly, Chandler turned this non-injury into a debilitating, crippling, life-altering injury and literally hobbled all around with a neck brace and cane. And the reason he did that is he needed an excuse for why he wasn't starting his job at SpaceX. In short, Chandler lied about virtually every aspect of his life to virtually everyone in his life. And for the most part, people did believe him. However, his parents were becoming more and more suspicious. Specifically, in 2021, he was telling them, oh yeah, I'm working at the insurance company, but he never had any money. He could barely pay rent to his family, if at all. And so his dad would say to him, how is it you are employed, but have no money? And the way Chandler would handle this is he would create fake email accounts pretending to be people in HR at this insurance company. And then acting as them, he would write these convoluted emails that had these ridiculous excuses for why Chandler had not been paid yet. And so he would have that fake email account email his real account account. And then Chandler in his actual email would write back really angrily and sternly saying, you got to fix this. My family's not happy. And then he would once again, pretend to be the HR person who would say, oh, I'm sorry. It's some issue that you can't affect. We're going to fix it, but you got to wait. And Chandler would take these exchanges and he would forward them to his father. And while Bart didn't necessarily totally believe what he was being shown, it was enough to get him to stop asking questions. But Bart and Krista were also suspicious of of other aspects of Chandler's life. Like for example, his school records. At some point he needed to show them his transcripts and he would tell them, oh, you know, I can't, I can't access my transcripts. And so Bart and Krista are like, why? 
Can't you just log in and pull up your unofficial transcripts at least? And the way Chandler would handle this was the same way he handled the insurance company. He would create fictitious email accounts of people that were college advisors at Madison College, where he claimed to have gone and graduated from, and he would do those phony back and forths where it looked like the college was telling Chandler, sorry, you can't get your transcripts. It's this huge problem that's totally our fault, not yours, but you just gotta wait. There's nothing else you can do. We can't get them for you right now. And when Chandler would send these exchanges to Bart, Bart would get totally worked up about it. And finally, he demanded that Chandler give him a phone number so he can talk to one of these college advisors. And so Chandler went out and got a burner phone from a convenience store and he gave that phone number to his dad. And then when his dad called this number up, somebody picked up someone introducing themselves as Daniel Spieth, which really was just Chandler disguising his voice. And Daniel Spieth would give Bart the same spiel about how, oh, I'm so sorry. It's all the college's fault that we can't get your son's transcripts. You're just going to have to wait. And so finally, on June 29th, 2021, Bart had just had it with his son. He was convinced his son was lying or there was something going on. There was just too much about his son's life that didn't add up. And so Bart decided he was just going to call Madison College and pretend to be Chandler and see if he could get his transcripts. And so he dialed a number for customer service at Madison College. And after a few rings, Omar Job, a customer service rep at Madison College, picked up. And initially, Bart was kind of aggressive and mean towards Omar for really no reason other than he was just so frustrated with this whole situation. And so he's on this call pretending to be Chandler and he's kind of barking at Omar to give me my transcripts right now. I go to your school. There's no reason you can keep them from me. But then after a couple of minutes, Omar finally was able to talk. And he said, you know, hey, Chandler, I looked you up in the system and you don't go to this school. You've never gone to the school save for maybe one semester and you failed out. And so it's at this point when Bart hears this that he just pauses for a really long amount of time on this call and then he begins asking follow-up questions that are not really connected to trying to get transcripts because now he knows the transcripts don't exist because his son didn't go to school. And so he begins asking Omar, does Daniel Spieth still work there? And so Omar would look him up and he would say, no, there's no Daniel Spieth that works here and there's no Daniel Spieth that's ever worked here. And because Chandler had used like five or six different names when pretending to be college advisors for Madison College, Bart, in addition to asking about that Daniel Spieth guy, asked about every other name he had interacted with, believing he was talking to Madison College. And one by one, Omar told him, I'm sorry, those people do not work here. I've never heard of these people. They're not in the directory. I'm sorry. And so finally, at the end of that 17 minute call, Bart knew his son was living a huge lie. And so he hung up with Omar and then Bart called real college advisors at Madison College and he set a meeting for July 1st at 3 p.m. And then he told Chandler that he had set this meeting and Chandler was going to come with him and they together were going to ask those college advisors why they can't produce Chandler's transcripts. Now, Bart, of course, knew Chandler did not have transcripts. And so he likely had set this meeting to get Chandler to call the meeting off and come clean about this big lie so that Bart could get his son back on the right track, stop lying and live a real life. But the way Chandler handled being caught was not to own up to any of this. He didn't call off the meeting. He just waited until the day of the meeting. And then he killed his father, killed his mother, and then dismembered their bodies and burned their body parts in the family fireplace, including their heads. And then when he couldn't destroy their bodies completely, he took what was left of their remains and scattered them all over town in parks and forests and rivers. He even put his father's headless, armless, legless torso behind his girlfriend's parents' house. And all the while, as he's doing this, he's spinning this ridiculous story to his girlfriend, to his brother, to other members of the Halderson family, to police, to colleagues of Bart and Krista, that Bart and Krista just up and left on the morning of July 2nd with this mystery couple. And oh, by the way, my parents, they were putting cash and silver bars in their luggage. So I don't know. They went up to White Lake and now they're gone. I don't know what happened to them. 
We don't know why Chandler chose the story he did. It's unclear if he was trying to make it seem like his parents were suspicious and had gotten into something that had maybe gotten them harmed or kidnapped, or if he was trying to make it seem like his parents were just super gullible and had been taken advantage of by this mystery couple. We don't know. He was just trying to make the whole situation seem plausibly suspicious. Ultimately though, Chandler did so many things that got him caught from the mountain of physical evidence he left behind inside of his house, where he killed and dismembered his parents, and also at the various dump sites where he didn't even bury the body parts. He would just put them underneath sticks and branches, and so they were very easy to find. To his extremely suspicious behavior on July 7th, when he walked into the police station and reported his parents missing. That whole time he was talking to police officers, he was acting so weird and was just saying things that didn't make sense, and he just totally came off like a guy who did not care at all that his parents were gone, and really just seemed like a guy who was hiding something. But the big breakthrough that happened on July 8th that broke the case open stemmed from the text message Krista's phone sent to Chandler's phone on July 4th. When Chandler walked into the police station on July 7th and said, my parents are missing, one of the first questions they had for him was, okay, well, when was the last time you spoke to your parents? And Chandler would tell them he got a text message from his mother, Krista, on Sunday, July 4th. And then he showed them the text message. And the text message said that they had arrived in White Lake and they were going to be sticking around for the parade and they'd be back in a couple of days. But the police noticed that this text message had been sent on July 4th, but in White Lake that year, the parade was on July 3rd. So when this text came through, the parade that anyone in White Lake would be aware of, it's a small place, you're not gonna miss this parade. The parade had already happened. So why would Krista be texting her son that she was going to stick around in White Lake for the parade that had already happened. And so this led police to check phone records and they would discover that text message was sent from Krista's phone to Chandler's phone. But when it was sent on July 4th, Krista's phone was not in White Lake. Instead, it was inside of the Halderson home, right near Chandler's phone. And so when police went to the Halderson house, they searched it and they found Krista's phone in the garage, underneath a drawer, inside of a shoe, wrapped in tin foil, next to her driver's license. And so Chandler had obviously sent that text message on July 4th, using his mother's phone to himself. But he had just gotten the date wrong of the parade. And so this discrepancy really opened up the floodgates and before long, it was beyond obvious that Chandler was the killer. And after a thorough investigation, it was determined that Chandler had acted entirely alone, meaning Catherine, his girlfriend, and his brother Mitchell had nothing to do with it. They were just innocent bystanders. Chandler would ultimately be found guilty of killing his parents and he would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Chandler Chandler has still not taken any responsibility for what he's done. Instead, he just tells anybody who will listen that his plan is to continue to appeal his verdict. So that's gonna do it. If you got some In 2007, the now famous cult classic movie, Into the Wild, was released to movie theaters for the first time. The movie, which is based on a true story, centers on the life of a young man named Christopher McCandless. In 1990, Christopher graduated from a really good school with honors, and by all accounts, he could have gone on to get a really good high-paying job, but Christopher didn't want a job. He wanted freedom. And so without telling his parents, because they would not have been happy about this idea, he gave gave away all of his possessions, he gave all his money to charity, and he headed off to Alaska to live off the grid by himself. He eventually would find this rusted out old city bus in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, and he would make this bus his shelter, and he would live inside of this bus for 113 days before he unfortunately died of starvation. While Christopher's story is obviously tragic, the movie about his life, Into the Wild, really focuses on Christopher's unrelenting spirit and his constant drive towards getting the thing he wants the most, which is freedom. And so at the end of this movie, the audience is left feeling not sad, but inspired. Inspired to take big risks in life and seek out adventure before it's too late. 
One audience member who was totally inspired by Christopher McCandless's life story was an 18-year-old young man named Matt Higgins who lived in Oregon. Matt was about to graduate high school, and unlike a lot of his peers, he had no idea what he should do after graduation, whether it was get a job or go to school. But after watching Into the Wild, a third option appeared to him, which was to head off into the wild, just like Christopher McCandless had done, except not permanently. Matt quickly fell in love with this option. He viewed it as a chance to kind of take a break from reality and go find himself, and then at the end of his stint in the wild, he could come back and, you know, get a job or go to school. And so Matt's official Into the Wild plan was that he would graduate in 2007 and then in the spring of 2008, he would hike the entirety of the California section of the infamously rugged and beautiful Pacific Crest Trail. And he would do this all on his own. This section of the Pacific Crest Trail that he planned on hiking was roughly 1,700 miles long. It began on the border of Mexico in Southern California, and it wound its way north up to the border of Oregon. The trail cut through deserts and up and over mountains, and there was lots lots of dangerous wildlife to contend with, and on top of that, there were many points along this trail where hikers were very isolated. They were not anywhere near civilization, and so if anything were to happen to them, they'd be on their own. And so, naturally, this hike was not a beginner hike. However, Matt was not a beginner hiker. He had grown up hiking and camping all over Oregon and the western United States. He had spent time in totally well-marked and safe areas, and he had also spent time hiking around very dangerous and isolated areas where there were cougars and bears and unmarked cliffs everywhere. And so Matt felt like, with his experience in the outdoors, he was perfectly suited to take on this big of an adventure. And in many ways, that was true. However, something was going to happen to him while he was out on the Pacific Crest Trail that no amount of hiking or camping experience could have prepared him for. So Matt graduated from high school in 2007, and in keeping with his plan, in the spring of 2008, he packed up his stuff, he headed to the airport, and he flew south to Southern California. And when he got there, he made his way all the way south to the border of Mexico, and there he picked up the start of the Pacific Crest Trail, and he began heading north. For the first few weeks of his hike, Matt would spend the entire day hiking as far as his body would allow him, and then at night, when it got too dark or when he got too tired, he would just set up his campsite right off the edge of the trail, and then after a quick bite to eat, he'd climb inside of his tent and he'd go to sleep. And then the next day, he'd get up early and he'd do it all over again. During those first few weeks, the only real adversity that Matt ever faced, beyond just kind of normal fatigue from long-distance hiking, was at one point, he got a little dehydrated, and another time he almost stepped on a rattlesnake. So besides those two things, really the hike had actually been fairly routine by Matt's standards. But when he reached the Lassen National Forest, which is a very dense forest in Northern California, located about 150 miles from the end of his hike, so the border of Oregon, when he got there, this hike of his would become anything but routine. Not long after stepping foot in Lassen Forest, Matt found himself walking along this winding dirt path where the trees on both sides of this path were pressed tightly up against the edges of this trail, and because of how densely packed the trees were together, it was almost like he had these walls on either side of him that extended a hundred feet into the air. And so it was very quiet and it was very dark as he was walking along, but Matt was enjoying it. All he could hear was the chirping of birds and the insects buzzing around him. It was peaceful. And so Matt's just kind of meandering his way through the forest. He's in no rush. And at some point, the trail he was on banked hard to the right. And so he makes this turn. And as he does, he looks up and what he sees kind of starts startles him. About 20 feet away from him, off to the right side of the trail, is this big boulder, and sitting on this boulder are two middle-aged people, a man and a woman. They were both dressed head to toe in white. They both looked very dirty and disheveled. The man had this big, unkempt beard, and both of them were just staring daggers at Matt. And so Matt felt awkward, and he immediately looked down as he continued walking towards them. 
But as he got within a few feet, he looked up and kind of awkwardly smiled at them and waved and said hi, and they didn't respond. They just continued to stare at him with no discernible expression on their face, and they watched him as he walked right past them. And so after Matt walked past these two people in white, he felt really uncomfortable because he knew they were still definitely staring at him as he walked away, and he didn't want to turn around and meet their eye contact. And so he's just kind of walking away, feeling that uncomfortable feeling of someone staring at him, and he's thinking to himself, why didn't they at least wave or acknowledge him in some way? Especially considering the fact that on the Pacific Crest Trail, people go days without seeing other people. Matt, in fact, had not seen another person in days until he saw these two. And so he's thinking, you know, how rude is that to just completely not react when another person walks past you on this trail? But Matt told himself, you know what? I don't know these people. I don't know what their issues are. You know, for all I know, they're foreign and they didn't understand what I said. And so maybe that's why they didn't say hello back. Who knows? But you know what? It's none of my business. And so Matt just continued walking along. He never turned around to look back at these two people in white. He just carried on. A few hours later, when the sun was starting to set, Matt was still walking along this winding trail with these huge trees on either side of him, and so visibility was getting pretty poor, and so he began looking for a place to make his camp. But because of how close these trees were to the edge of this trail, and considering how dense these trees were, there was no spot for him to make his campsite without completely blocking the trail. And Matt did not want to block the trail for other people, and so what he did is he left the trail and he walked 300 feet or so into these thick trees where he found this little clearing and that's where he set up his tent. Once it was all set up, he made some food for himself on his little stove and then after he was done eating, he packaged up all of his leftover food inside of a waterproof bag and he sealed that up and then he tied some cord to the bag and threw the bag up and over a branch of a nearby tree and kind of tied it off so the bag was sitting well off the ground. This was to make sure no bears could get to his food. And so after his leftovers were secured high up in a tree, it was totally pitch black outside. And so Matt just climbed into his tent, he zipped it up, climbed into his sleeping bag, and he fell asleep. The next morning, Matt got up right as the sun was starting to rise. And so it was still pretty dark outside, but there was a little bit of light. And so Matt unzipped his tent and he looked outside. And the first thing he noticed was his bag of food that he had put up in the tree was gone. And so Matt stepped out of his tent and he looked around thinking, you know, maybe it fell to the ground or something, but it wasn't there. It was just gone. And so Matt thought to himself, you know, I didn't hear anything last night, but I guess a bear must have come into the campsite, found the food and run off with it. And so Matt began walking over to the tree where he had strung the food up to begin looking on the ground for bear prints to confirm his theory that that was who took his food. And so he walks over, he's looking around, he doesn't see any bear prints, but he does see two sets of human boot prints neither of which were his. And before he could even process that, he realized these prints, these human prints, were not just underneath this tree where the food was. These prints, as he looked around him, extended all the way up to his tent and all around his tent and all over his campsite. And so as Matt is looking at this crazy trail of human prints all over the place, he's thinking to himself, how is this possible? I went to bed last night when it was already pitch black outside and I got up basically right at sunrise, so it was still dark outside. So these two people that were walking all over my campsite and cutting my food down, they somehow navigated here 300 feet off the main trail in the middle of nowhere. They navigated here in total pitch blackness and they did it silently without waking me up. How is that even possible? And so after running through this thought process, Matt realized the only logical conclusion was that the two people he saw on the rock, the people in white, had followed him after seeing him. They saw where he left the trail and they had waited until he fell asleep and then snuck out and robbed him. As Matt's thinking about this, he suddenly realized that maybe they're still around. Maybe he's still being watched. And so he began whipping his head around, looking in all directions, almost expecting to see the man and the woman in white kind of poking out from behind a tree. But when he looked around, he couldn't see anyone. However, he started to get that sense that he was being watched. And so feeling really uncomfortable 
uncomfortable, he quickly packed up his campsite and walked as quickly and calmly as he could toward the trail. And as he walked, he kept thinking to himself that these people are going to jump out from behind a tree or they're going to grab me from behind. And so he's walking faster and faster and faster. And he finally gets to the trail and he looks down the trail and up the trail. He kind of looks all around. He doesn't see anybody. And so he tells himself, okay, they're gone. So he took a deep breath. He composed himself and he started walking north again along the trail. Matt walked for several hours, periodically looking over his shoulder, again, expecting to see the man and woman in white, but he never did. And eventually, this narrow path, kind of cutting through the dense forest, opened up to this big, beautiful field. And by that point, the sun was high in the sky. And so Matt's walking in this very beautiful open area. He can see in all directions. There's sunlight beaming down on him. And so even though he was totally rattled by what had happened the night before, he found himself kind of becoming more at ease about the situation. He was far less paranoid and he began telling himself, you know, as creepy as it is that those people in white almost certainly followed him and snuck up on his campsite in the middle of the night, as bad as that is, he thought, you know what, they probably were just super hungry and they clearly needed the food more than he did. And so, you know what, those people, they can have my food, whatever. And so Matt just continued on telling himself he would never have to deal with the people in white ever again. However, he would be wrong. Over the next three days, Matt continued making his way north through the Lassen Forest, and the trail he was on would weave between those big, beautiful open areas, back inside those very densely forested areas where the trees were practically right on top of you. And during those three days, Matt did not see the people in white. He did not have any nighttime encounters with anybody. Nothing got stolen. And so that only reinforced the idea that, you know, he had been a target of opportunity. They had taken what they wanted from him and they were no longer following him. But on the fourth day after the food stealing incident, things would get spooky for Matt again. On that fourth night, Matt was once again forced to leave the trail he was on. He was in one of those very densely forested areas and walk well off the trail to find a clearing for his tent. And so he walked, you know, several hundred feet away. He finds this clearing. He sets up his tent. And then also he sets up a perimeter of sticks all around the outside of his campsite. This was a precaution he had begun taking after the food stealing incident. These sticks were an early warning system where if any animal or person came too close to his campsite, they would step in theory on these sticks and they would break and they would alert Matt in the middle of the night. And so after his campsite was all set up, and all prepared, Matt sat down and had a quick bite to eat. And then after storing his food, he climbed inside of his tent and he fell asleep. A few hours later, Matt suddenly woke up. Now, when he woke up, he opened his eyes, but it's pitch black in his tent, there are no windows in his tent, and it's pitch black outside. So even with his eyes open, he can't see anything. And so he's just laying there with his eyes open, but it's total darkness, and he's just listening intently because he doesn't really know why he woke up, if something startled him, or if there's no reason at all. And so he's just laying there and he's listening, and as he's listening, he hears the distinct sound of something stepping on one of the sticks in his perimeter. And so he hears the stick break and his heart just starts racing because he knows that an animal or a person is just a few feet away from him. And so instinctively, he kind of begins to pull his arm as quietly as he can out of his sleeping bag and he reaches over and he grabs his hunting knife. And as he grabs the handle of the knife and he brings it closer to him, he hears the sound of more footsteps. Whatever has stepped on the stick has not slowed down at all. They don't care about the sound they just made. They're still moving towards his tent. And so Matt's starting to get really freaked out because he knows that, you know, it could be an animal, but just a couple of days ago, two people were in his campsite stealing his food and walking all around his tent. And so that's what's going through his head. And so Matt's laying there preparing himself to potentially have to slash out if anybody came close to his tent. I mean, he's in the middle of nowhere. If a person is out here, it's not his friend. And so he's laying there, he's kind of shaking and he's listening really intently. And the footsteps are just getting closer and closer and closer to his tent until they stop 
right next to his head. They are literally about a foot away from him. And so he can't see anything. He's just listening really intently. And then he starts to hear whispering. But the whispering is not coming from this person right here. The whispering is coming from everywhere in the forest. It's coming from all different directions. And so Matt doesn't know what to think about this. And as he's hearing this whispering, which is getting more and more frantic, whoever is standing right outside of his tent begins circling his tent. So now he hears footsteps just walking in a circle around his tent while frantic whispers are coming in from all directions. And so at this point, Matt is so terrified, he's just frozen. He knows that he's holding that knife, but he won't be able to do anything with it. He's just petrified. And then as soon as this total nightmare had begun, it just stopped. The whispering, silence. The footsteps stopped. And so in a way, it was kind of relieving. But in another way, Matt's laying there thinking, I want to hear the sound of footsteps retreating into the forest, leaving. But I haven't heard that. It went from footsteps all around the tent and whispering everywhere to silence as if whoever is out there is still out there. And they're just standing there waiting for him. And because it's so dark, he can't even look. He can't look outside and see. And so he's left just laying in his tent, wondering if one, two, three, four, five, ten people are just waiting outside of his tent. He's got no idea. And so finally, the sun would come up in the morning. And again, Matt has not heard the sound of retreating footsteps. And so maybe they're still just standing outside. But once the sun had totally come up and there was some light outside that he could see through his tent, Matt decided he just had to check. And so he reached over and he quickly unzipped the flap of the tent and he looked outside. He didn't see anyone. He leapt outside with his knife, ready to confront anyone who was out there, but there was no one. And so Matt, he's not thinking, oh great, you know, they're gone. He's thinking, you know, are they just like a few feet away hiding behind trees? And so for a few minutes, Matt just began looking all around his campsite, kind of expecting to see, you know, those people in white or other people. He doesn't know, but he doesn't see anyone. And then Matt starts thinking to himself, you know, was this just a nightmare? Did that not even happen? Am I imagining this? But when he looked down, he saw clear boot prints all over his campsite, including a nice track all the way around his tent. And so this nightmare really had played out in real life. And so he quickly gets everything back into his pack. He throws it on his shoulder and he just starts running back towards the trail. And when he got to the trail, he continued running north. And as he's running along and looking over his shoulder the whole time, he's telling himself, I just need to get out of Lassen National Forest. I need to get out of the people in White's turf, get away from this place and I'll be left alone. And so that motivated him to spend the whole day moving as fast as he possibly could. And by that afternoon, he had finally escaped Lassen National Forest. He was out and he was in one of these smaller towns that kind of butted up alongside this forest. And so that night he camped out right near this town. He wanted to be as close to civilization as possible to ensure his safety. And so as he's laying in his tent that night, he began thinking about what had happened over the past couple of days. At this point, he was nearly certain that the people in white that he had seen on that boulder, they had to be behind these nighttime encounters. They just had to be. And so he's thinking to himself, okay, well, the first encounter I had with them, you know, when they stole his food, yeah, that's creepy, but it makes sense. They followed him. They went to his campsite. They stole his food. Okay, fine. That makes sense to him. But the second encounter, the one that had happened the night before, that didn't make any sense. Assuming it was, again, the people in white responsible, that meant they had been following Matt the whole time and he had not seen them somehow, even though over the last couple of days, he had been looking over his shoulder constantly, looking for those people, but he didn't see them and they still managed to follow him all the way over several days to this other unmarked campsite, hundreds of feet off the main trail. So how did they do that? And then Two, once they were at his campsite and he's laying there listening to them, walking around the campsite, whispering to each other, what were they doing? And then how did the footsteps and whispering just stop immediately and he didn't even hear the sound of them retreating into the woods? You know, how did they do that? And so Matt would go over this and over this until finally he would fall asleep. And then the next morning when he got up, it was the first thing he was thinking about, the people in white. What were they doing and why and where were they? And so as Matt packed up his campsite that morning, it did cross his mind, you know, that maybe he should just stop the hike right now and call his family, have them come pick him up and get out of here. 
of here. But this hike, this huge hike he had planned was really important to him. And he was only about 100 miles away from the finish line, which meant he had already hiked over 1,600 miles. And he just didn't want to quit. He wanted to finish what he started. And so he packed up his stuff, he threw it over his shoulder, and he continued on. And so that day, Matt would leave that little town, and he would make his way up into another very dense forest called the Mount Shasta Forest. Mount Shasta was a lot like the Lassen Forest, except Mount Shasta has a very disturbing backstory. Specifically, lots and lots of people go missing inside of Mount Shasta, and often they go missing under baffling circumstances. The most frightening of these missing persons reports are when someone comes back, the survivor of the event, and they will say, you know, they saw their hiking companion. They clearly saw them. And then they turned their back on them just for a few moments, a few minutes, whatever it was. And when they turned back around, the person they were with was now gone. No trace of them, nothing, they're just gone. And despite a massive search for them, they're never found again. There is a distressing number of missing people in Mount Shasta that sound just like that. It's totally terrifying. So with that in mind, Matt makes his way into the Mount Shasta forest. And even though it totally stressed him out to once again be walking on these dirt pathways where the trees are very tight on either side of you, they're very dense. And as he's walking, he's kind of looking in both directions, expecting to see somebody watching him. Despite feeling that way, Matt just continued to stay focused and kept telling himself to just continue on, continue on because you're so close to the end. And so the first three days that he was in the Mount Shasta forest, Forest, Matt would just keep his head down and very stoically every day he would just hike as far as he possibly could. In the evening he would set up his campsite either right off the trail or maybe a little ways off the trail in a clearing and he didn't have any run-ins with the people in white or anybody else for that matter. He was totally left alone. But on his fourth day in the Mount Shasta Forest, all that would change. On that fourth day, Matt found himself not inside one of those very dense forested areas, but rather in this very open trail that was up on the side of this mountain. And because this trail was fairly high up in elevation, the tree coverage was fairly sparse. And so there was great visibility. He could see miles ahead of him. And when he turned around, he could see miles behind him. And so Matt is just walking along this trail, kind of enjoying the day. It's beautiful outside. And at some point, he turns turns around and looks behind him. Now, all day he'd been doing that and he had not seen anyone. But this time when he turned around, he saw two little white dots miles and miles back, slowly making their way along the trail that he was on. It was the people in white, they were back. At this point, Matt was at least 50 miles or more away from that first place he had walked past the people in white when they were sitting on that boulder, which meant one, Matt was right. These people in white really had followed him and almost certainly were responsible for the nighttime visits he was getting. And two, for reasons unknown, they were still following him. Matt suddenly didn't care at all about completing his big hike. He just wanted to get the heck away from those people. And so very quickly, he pulled out his map and he looked, and to his horror, he realized he was in one of the most isolated portions of the entire hike. He was at least 25 miles away from the nearest civilization, a little town called Castella, California. And so without a better option, Matt put the map back in his pocket. He took one last look at the people in white who were making steady gains on him. And then Matt just turned away from them and began booking it down the trail. And Matt would run for hours and hours and hours without stopping. Even when he turned around and could no longer see the people in white, he just kept on running. And then when the sun set and he could barely see the trail, he just kept on running. It literally wasn't until it was so dark outside that he actually actually couldn't see the ground anymore that Matt finally, totally exhausted, came to a stop. And then from there, he turned and left the trail and walked way away from the trail, hundreds of feet deep into the forest to get as far away from these people in white as he possibly could. And so finally, he found this clearing very far away from the trail. He set up his tent right in the middle of it. And then he very diligently
diligently laid out his perimeter of sticks around his campsite, making sure there were no gaps. And then he climbed inside of his tent. He zipped it up and then keeping on all of his stuff in case he needed to make a run for it. He got inside of his sleeping bag and he just laid there with no expectation that he was going to sleep. He was terrified. As he laid there, he thought to himself, okay, I have now run at least several miles ahead of them. I know that was them. I know I got some distance on them. There's no way they saw where I turned off the trail and where I've set up this campsite. So they can't possibly find me. And so Matt would lay in the tent for several hours, just waiting to fall asleep. And then finally he would start to get tired because at this point it's totally quiet outside. He hasn't heard anything. And so he begins to doze off to sleep. And as he's getting more and more tired, he hears the sound of someone stepping on his perimeter of sticks. And as soon as he hears that stick break, he hears the all too familiar whispering pick up all around the forest. And then something new happens. Before Matt can even do anything, his tent lights up like a Christmas tree. Someone is shining a light on his tent. Someone has snuck up on his campsite in the middle of nowhere, hundreds and hundreds of feet off the trail in the middle of the night. They've found him and they're shining a light on him. And then the light clicks off and it's silent. And at this point, Matt's fight or flight instinct kicks in and he rips off his sleeping bag. He jumps outside and begins screaming nonsense and flailing around with the knife, trying to intimidate these people to get away from him. And then after he stops for a second, he hears a stick crunch right behind him. And he whips his head around to look at who is standing right behind him. And as he's turning out of his peripheral vision, he sees a dark figure running towards him. He doesn't think twice, he just turns and begins running away from the campsite. Now remember, it's pitch black in the forest. There's trees everywhere. And so Matt's smashing into trees, branches are hitting him, he's falling to the ground, but he is on a pure adrenaline high and he is just sprinting as fast as he possibly can away from this person who is likely still chasing him. And after five minutes of running, he stumbles and falls forward and kind of lands at the base of this fallen tree. The tree had landed in such a way that it was kind of propped on a rock. So there was a small gap underneath the tree. And so Matt, thinking quickly, kind of slid himself underneath this log and positioned himself so he was looking back in the direction he was running from. And as he laid there, he saw in the distance this light bobbing around. These people are looking for him. They're searching the forest for him. And so he watched in horror, tucked underneath this log, as whoever had the light and whoever else was with them, they moved closer and closer and closer, but they did not find him tucked underneath the log. They just walked right on past him. And so Matt would remain underneath this log all night until finally the sun came up. And at that point, even though it was fairly obvious that whoever was looking for him, they were now gone, Matt was still terrified. And so he stayed under the log for several hours until it was about early afternoon. And then he finally pulled himself out from under the log and he looked around, he couldn't see anyone. And then instead of going back to his campsite and getting his gear, he just totally abandoned it. He was worried that these people in white or whoever it was, that they were still gonna be there. And so so he just turned and continued running away from his campsite back out to the trail. And once he got the trail, he continued running on the trail all the way to Costella, California. And when he got there, he hitchhiked his way to the town of Mount Shasta. And there he would speak to police as well as the forestry service about what he had experienced. And so they would take all of his information down and they would put him up in a motel for the night. And then the next day, Matt would get in touch with his family and they would drive from Oregon to Mount Shasta they would pick him up and they would take him back home. Months later, Matt would contact the Mount Shasta police and the Forest Service and would just follow up and say, hey, have you learned anything else about these people in white? Have you caught them? Has anybody else come forward? And the police would say, you know, they did have a number of people coming forward saying that things had been stolen from their campsites. These are people that were in Mount Shasta, in Lassen Forest and the surrounding forests. But Matt was the only one who had reported being terrorized by this mysterious couple in white. And so to this day, Matt has no idea who those two people were, what they wanted with him, beyond obviously the food they took. I mean, they continued to stalk him for nearly a hundred miles. And he has no idea how they were able to keep finding his campsites that were hundreds of feet off the main trail in unmarked areas that they would somehow navigate to in total darkness without alerting Matt. It's all a big mystery.
So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please hide a Bluetooth speaker in the like button's bedroom and then proceed to play Siberian Husky screaming audio all night long. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. We now have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we upload brand new, never before heard podcast exclusive stories on Monday mornings. And then on Thursday mornings, we upload remastered audio from some of our most popular YouTube videos. Again, the podcast is just called Mr. Ballin Podcast, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, anywhere you find podcasts, you can find it there. We also have two additional YouTube channels. One is called Mr. Ballin Shorts, which just posts random short videos and lost episodes. And the other channel is called Mr. Ballin and Espanol, and it's a Spanish language channel. We also post near daily content on our Facebook page and our Snapchat channel. Both of those are just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username on all platforms is just at Mr. Ballin and I really do read the majority of my DMs. We also have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels,